My name is Jacob, and I study the ethics of design here at Dalton. And tonight, I want to look at what senses we use to investigate things that we cannot see. A lot of times, this is the job of medicine. So, 400 BC, this is Hippocrates. Um, he's often seen as one of the first people to turn medicine into a career, something you can do as a job. And he really believed in the sense of touch. This is a painting from a series of paintings on the history of medicine by the artist Robert Baum. And you can see that he is using his sense of touch to investigate what is going on inside his patient's body. Um, he can use sense of touch to figure out what's there that shouldn't be, or what, that, what isn't there that should be. But if we uh, fast forward a couple thousand years, um, this is 1860s with René Lynette. He was the inventor of the stethoscope. So now we're using our sense of hearing. Um, this was actually the first prototype of the stethoscope. It was essentially a foot-long cardboard tube. He's looking at the same area of the body, probably for the same types of problems, but he's using a completely different sense, his sense of hearing. <coughs> and then, a couple of decades later, we get the x-ray. The x-ray um, receptor was invented by Willem Brinchen, and you can think of the x-ray as a density map of what's inside the body. The denser the thing that the x-rays are going through, the darker they show up on this image, the lighter, um, or the less dense it is, such as skin, the lighter it shows up. This is actually the first ever published x-ray, and it is an x-ray of the x-ray inventor's wife's left hand. That bowl that you see is her wedding ring. Um, the thing about x-rays, though, is they're not very good at looking into the brain. So eventually we developed the MRI. Um, this stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. And finally, we can look at the brain. It's just too soft and fleshy for x-rays to pick up anything. This is the first time that the MRI was ever mentioned in a newspaper. This is the New York Times in 1973, and you can see the author is struggling to explain how this technology works to people, saying cancer was found electronically. <laughs> <laughs> but um, an MRI only shows us the structure of the brain. It doesn't show us what's actually going on. So a PET scan, which was developed a few years later, will actually show us activity within the brain. An MRI will show us if you have a tumor. A PET scan will show us what area of the brain is responsible for thinking about puppies. <laughs> so what's actually going on inside this image? Um, it is actually digital at this point. So a scanner is um, is trying to figure out where um, the most active areas of the brain are by loading up the patient with a radioactive tracer. That tracer goes in their blood. You let the patient sit for a minute or two, and then you put them in the scanner. And the scanner tries to figure out which areas of the brain are emitting the most radiation. So you actually end up with a grid of numbers grid of values, of levels of activity. But humans are very, very bad at looking at grids of numbers. So we map those numbers to colors, and that's what's happening in the, it, happening in the lower left-hand corner. That exact same data maps to colors instead of numbers. And a couple of, just two years later, this is what we end up with. This is what most PET scans look like today. You have one slice of the brain in the center, those radiating lines coming out of it are just background radiation, and along the right side of the image is the gradient that we are mapping the values to. Your lowest value on the bottom, mapped to black, your highest value on the top, white. The way that works is let's say you set up a gradient, and we wanted to distribute the value, values from zero to one and map them to these colors. So you distribute them evenly along the gradient from zero to one. And let's say it was medically necessary to figure out the difference between 0.4 and 0.5. In this case, units don't really matter. So we'll take a sample at those two points. We get two shades of gray. Now those shades of gray are very, very similar. If you saw them next to each other, if you had good vision, you might be able to tell that they were slightly different. But you'd have a difficult time figuring out which one was brighter. Or you'd have an especially difficult time placing them into that gradient, trying to map a value to each one. So pretty quickly, we figure out that color helps a lot. So here's a different gradient. It still starts at black, but this time it cycles through the entire rainbow and ends at red. We'll um, distribute the exact same values along it, and we'll take two samples at the exact same points. Now, it is a lot easier to tell the difference between 0.4 and 0.5, because it's actually the difference between two totally different colors, blue and green. So going back to that image I showed you earlier, scientists quickly start applying these ideas to brain scans. So this is the exact same brain data mapped to a different color gradient. On the left, it's that same rainbow gradient I showed you. On the right, it's a different modification of it. It just goes through different colors in a different order. Eventually, scientists start adding colored lines into the mix so we can pack even more um, 
degradation between data and the same gradient, and pretty quickly it gets completely out of hand. <laughs> um, the guy who collects these skins, actually, uh, his name is Brian Murphy, he points out many issues with them. The first, he calls dialing a defect. This is when journalists write about brain scans and what they've found without really knowing how the science works, which happens all the time. And they'll just simply choose whichever gradient makes most obvious the area of the brain that they're talking about. Um, another issue is that every medical school tends to have their favorite gradient. And so, depending on what school you went to, you're trained your entire medical career on one of these gradients, and it makes collaboration very difficult because you have to literally retrain yourself on how to look at the brain before you can do any research with a different school that learned a different gradient. Even colors are problematic because our society has certain cultural associations with certain colors. We tend to assume red means danger or stop, blue means cold, green means go. And it's very difficult, probably even impossible, for even a well-trained scientist to get past these cultural associations because we rely on them so much. And what about colorblind scientists or even completely blind scientists? Do we really want to exclude this entire segment of the population from studying something that we already can't see inside the brain? I don't think so. So let's go back to the, um, the PET scan that I showed you earlier. And let's go ahead and zoom. Can we zoom in a little bit more? And uh, can you go ahead and enhance, please? <laughs> Let's compare that to this. It looks pretty similar, but this, we'll zoom out, we'll zoom out one more time. This is actually a mountain range. And those black snaking lines going through it are rivers. It's a popular way of mapping topographic data. You get the terrain of the land, and you assign different elevations to different colors. Exactly the same as the brain. So let's say this is a mountain range. You have your highest peak on the left. You can imagine a lake in the middle. Um, let's say that this is sea level. And we take different samples along that terrain. And we end up with a black to white gradient. Black is our lowest points of elevation. White is our highest points. So these two images, the terrain map on the left and the brain scan on the right, are maps of totally different things using the same method of assigning values, numerical values, to a black to white gradient. And we already have plenty of scripts and programs that can quickly convert terrain data, which we store in these geotip files, they're just black and white images, into 3D models. So I went ahead and ran the brain scan through one of those pieces of programs, or one of those scripts. And this is what I got. So this is a 3D model of the brain scan that I showed you earlier. Um, the peaks would be the highest levels of brain activity, the valleys would be the lowest level. Again, this is one slice of the brain, and we're just building up our Z dimension by how active that area is. Cool thing about 3D models is we can 3D print them. <laughs> and I went ahead and did that. So this is a 3D printed brain skin. You could hold it on its side and you could look for the tallest peak. Um, that again is the level of highest activity. You could feel this. You could imagine a blind scientist actually feeling the, feeling the brain and trying to investigate which areas are most active or trying to identify an issue. We can use calipers and measuring tapes, tools that we use to investigate the physical world to investigate the brain. And my favorite part is that the gradient along the right side became a ramp. It simply goes from the lowest value to the highest value. Now, I don't make these models to try and say that the entire history of studying the brain is wrong or that we've been on a wrong course, but I do make them to ask, why has vision become the precedent? Why has our sense of sight become our top ranked priority in our top sense? Why don't we also trust in our sense of touch? Thank you.